is eight o'clock. This is the UK Tonight. Coming up, a real and serious threat. Hackers backed by the Chinese state are blamed for attacks on the UK. Beijing is accused of targeting UK democracy in campaigns against the Electoral Commission and MPs. In response, the government today announced sanctions. However, critics say that's like turning up for a gunfight armed with a wooden spoon. Also tonight, murderers can get away with murder. The families of the Nottingham attack victims speak out after a review found the Crown Prosecution Service was right to accept the killer's plea of manslaughter rather than pursuing murder charges. No farming, no food. A convoy of more than 100 tractors descends on Westminster as farmers protest against substandard imports and dishonest labelling, claiming the UK's food security is at risk. And fears that Asian hornets may have become established here after the government confirmed the earliest ever recorded sighting in this country. All that to come and much more here on The UK Tonight. China has been publicly blamed for two cyber attacks targeting democracy in the UK. The government says Beijing is linked to those who attack the Electoral Commission, as well as they carried out a campaign targeting MPs who are critical of China. Tonight, China called the claims malicious slander, but their ambassador has been summoned by the Foreign Office and sanctions have been announced against those allegedly responsible for the attacks. However, Conservative MPs have called that response feeble, and opponents say it's like turning up to a gunfight with a wooden spoon. Here's our political editor, Beth Rigby. A government plagued by domestic problems forced to pivot to international ones on the last day of business before the Easter break. Right Honourable Oliver Downing. The Deputy Prime Minister confirming China's trying to undermine our democracy. The United Kingdom has today sanctioned two individuals and one entity associated with the Chinese state-affiliated APT31 group for involvement in malicious cyber activity. New sanctions, but the cyber attacks on Britain's election watchdog and a group of parliamentarians long known. And for those MPs targeted, the response simply not enough. America has sanctioned over 40 people in Hong Kong. We have sanctioned none and three lowly officials only in Xinjiang. Surely this means that the integrated review should now be changed. China deny the claims, calling the decision an anti-China political farce and accusing the UK of spreading misinformation. But Britain's action is aligned with Western allies, the announcement today coordinated with Washington. The golden era of Chinese relations under David Cameron in 2015 now seems an age away. China is behaving in an increasingly uh, assertive way abroad, authoritarian at home, and it represents an epoch-defining challenge. United with allies over the threat, but division still between government and MPs about how to respond. What well, You said that there are still divisions within government in your statement about how to deal with this threat? There's, there's no division yep. amongst parliamentarians, and it's not a part of political um, <coughs> matter. Where there is, I think, still a grey area is the attitude of the Foreign Office in particular, which doesn't like to rock the boat. But the government's decision to sanction just two individuals and one company is being called feeble by some Tory MPs. Even action aligned with Western allies can't unite this fractured Conservative Party. This isn't about uh, playing party politics. This is about defending the national security of the United Kingdom. That's why I made the announcement today. That's why I made it in conjunction with our allies in the United States. But in a bumper election year where more voters than ever in history will head to the polls in over 60 countries, how significant is the wider threat to global democracy? I can't help but say that they're sort of trying to shut the stable door after the horse has bolted. I worry about MPs being hacked. I mean, that's a security issue, and it puts people off doing these jobs. The worry around here is it's all too little, too late. And as Parliament breaks up for Easter, the PM's still struggling to find any point of harmony with his MPs. Beth Rigby, Sky News, Westminster. 
The fact China is attempting to spy on the UK online shouldn't come as a surprise. However, this announcement is more a reminder that the threat is constant and increasingly sophisticated. So what exactly is China accused of doing? Our science and technology editor Tom Clark has been taking a look. Using an alphabet of state-linked hacking groups, Beijing is accused of infiltrating government, institutions and companies around the world. Much of their interest is economic advantage, but also a desire to snoop on those perceived as dissidents or critics of China. Like most espionage, it's rarely made public, but the government has chosen to unmask China and its virtual fingerprints on two recent hacks. APT31, alias Judgment Panda, is a Chinese hacking group almost certainly responsible for hacking the email accounts of UK MPs linked to criticism of China, says the UK National Cyber Security Centre. It also identifies China as being behind a cyber attack on the Electoral Commission in 2021, during which time they had access to data including email addresses from the Electoral Register. How did they do it? APT31 used a technique called spear phishing, the same as phishing in which a user is tricked into downloading malware by clicking on an innocent looking link, except spear phishing is targeted at a specific individual or group, usually via their email addresses. Details weren't given of the Electoral Commission hack, however the NCSC recently issued new guidance on a type of fileless cyber attack called living off the land. This exploits native code used by large providers like Microsoft, so attackers can access systems virtually undetected and inhabit their computers. The timing of the move by the UK government also appears to be part of an international response. A court in New York has charged seven Chinese nationals it claims are also members of APT31, with hacking offences including spear phishing attacks on US lawmakers. Well, for more on this, let's bring in Jude McCorrie, Chief Executive of the Cyber and Fraud Centre, who joins us now on the UK tonight. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Uh, first of all, your take on this being made public and the, the level of seriousness you think is involved here. So this first came to our attention last year when um, we were told the electoral roll had been attacked the year previously. Um, I think the significance around this attack is that we it's probably the biggest cyber attack that is a, that has affected um, most of the UK citizens. So we're looking at 40 million data points that were accessed, and that's the, the citizens of this country. Um, and also, I don't the significance around it. I don't see a lot of correspondence to the people who have been affected, i.e. the citizens of this country, around how to, that they should be able to protect themselves and that this has affected them, not just politicians. Why would China be wanting to hack these MPs, the Electoral Commission? What kind of data do they want and what would they do with it? So that, I suppose, is a question that we'll have to find out. And I'm sure uh, people above my pay grade and above my remit have been investigating that. But if we look back to the things like Cambridge Analytica um, with the Facebook thing, so looking at how democracies are worked and especially around the Western societies as well. So I think it's more an information gathering because we haven't seen wide scale criminal activity on those 40 million data points. We keep pointing out here on Sky News, it's a big year for elections, not just in this country, not just in America, but around the world. And as Tom Clark, our, our science and technology editor, was pointing out there, the UK's response today does seem to be part of an international response. Yeah, so and in the last two hours, we've seen a response from the US as well. And um, we've seen that they have announced sanctions and also arrests of the two individuals that were named with the sanctions against them to, in relation to the attacks or perceived attacks on the MPs in the country as well. So we do think that this is probably something more wide scale than just the UK. But because of the time difference, I'm sure things will unravel over the next few hours as well. How much of a threat do you think China is to UK democracy? The government has refused to brand China as a threat. And when the government announced sanctions today, it, you know, it was seen as sadly insufficient, feeble, derisory were some of the other um, terms used for it. Another term was like bringing a wooden spoon to a gunfight. So basically that isn't something that I would comment on. Um, my remit and my concerns are around the data resilience and the security of the citizens of the UK, of Scotland particularly, but also of the UK, and also around organisations and companies as well to make sure that we are as cyber resilient as possible. What the UK government do in relation to politics 
hasn't got much to do with me. Um, and I would rather us basically see this threat around everything. So it's not just around China, but also in Russia. The threat is really real, not just around um, politics and the elections and stuff. This is something that can harm individuals and organisations every single day in the UK. This might seem, you know, a little bit far-fetched and beyond the realms of people watching at home today in terms of, you know, sitting back and watching this and thinking, oh, does it affect me? How serious a threat is it to me personally? Could you answer that kind of question to people watching at home thinking, how's this really going to affect me? So I don't think there's any immediate effect, and there wasn't last year either when we found out of the attack because the data was accessed two years ago. And as I said, we d we haven't seen any wide-scale criminal activity on that amount of data being accessed. Um, so, But basically what I would say is that the threat is real from anything, not just this attack, so that we see attacks every single day. We've seen the Capita, we've seen Boots, we've seen British Airways. So there's a lot mm. of cyber attacks, not just around the political side of things. And um, what I'd say to people is assume nothing, believe no one and check everything and make sure that you are protected um, around be as cyber resilient as possible. Check passwords, vulnerabilities, um, have two-factor authentication. And that's not just for politicians, that's for everybody in this society. Jude, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because you do just think so much of our lives are online now, personal information, whether that's your date of birth, where you live, your telephone number, what way you vote. It's all out there online. And everybody is vulnerable. And I just, you know, I just wonder how serious this could get, that kind of personal information and what it could be used for, because the sheer nature of the way we live is that information has to be online for us to be able to access anything now. Well, including myself, we've all got Apple Watches, so we're giving away so much data for free every day of our lives. So Apple or whoever they sell my data to know what time I get up at, they know how long I've slept, they know what my blood pressure is, they know what my resting heart rate is, yeah. they know when I exercise. So we can't give much more away than that kind of personal data, and we do do it. Um, what we, what I would ask that when we do things as citizens, that we give our details and we give our anything we need to give to access the electoral roll, that people in government and people in these organisations are good custodians of our data. The same way I'm trusting Apple to be a good custodian of my data. We've seen data breaches from everywhere. So please think about the citizens and not just um, politicians who have had things attacked, but think of everybody every day and act in good faith when you take this data from people. Uh, Jude McCory, a CEO at Cyber and Ford Centre, thank you so much for your time here in the UK tonight. Thank you. Thank you. The families of the Nottingham attack victims have called for an overhaul of the UK's murder laws. This is after a watchdog found prosecutors were right to accept the manslaughter plea of their loved one's killer. Valdo Calacane had been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and admitted killing students Barnaby Webber and Grace O'Malley Kumar and school caretaker Ian Coates last June. Barnaby's mother, Emma, said today that until the law changes, murderers can get away with murder. Sky's crime correspondent Martin Brunt has more. They arrived still believing the killer should have been charged with murder, but not really expecting the review to agree with them and it didn't. When Valdo Calacane went on his violent rampage, he had a severe mental illness, said the CPS chief inspector. So prosecutors were right to accept his reduced plea of manslaughter with diminished responsibility. We're disappointed, but not entirely surprised. Until the law changes in this country, the diminished responsibility um, uh, charge and plea uh, means that murderers can get away with murder. In Nottingham, Callacane stabbed three victims. He was sent to a secure hospital for treatment indefinitely. If he'd been charged with murder and convicted, it would have meant life in prison, a proper punishment in the family's eyes. In a hijacked van, he tried to run down three more people. He didn't stop until police arrested him. <laughs> Finally, it was over. He'd killed students Grace O'Malley Kumar, Barnaby Webber and school caretaker Ian Coates. Mr Coates' family were later left out of a key meeting with prosecutors. 
it just added to the, the rail room and that the other families have suffered. They were obviously informed of the decision they were going to take with the diminished responsibility, which they wholeheartedly didn't agree with, like ourselves. Uh, and we felt that we were learning it at the last minute as well, so we didn't have an opportunity to say no or question it. In September 2021, Calicane was sectioned under the Mental Health Act. On the way to hospital, he hit a police officer. Months later, he allegedly assaulted a flatmate. He was detained again in a mental health centre. Both times he was released to be managed in the community. Later that year, a warrant was issued for his arrest. He was still wanted for attacking the police officer. He was never arrested and was still a wanted man in June last year when he carried out the Nottingham attacks. The CPS chief inspector urged the government to reconsider an old idea, categorising murder charges. Currently, there is murder, which obviously is what this individual did, and manslaughter. That actually is very difficult to understand, and therefore the government need to think whether we should be moving into, as the Law Commission said, first-degree murder, second-degree murder, manslaughter. In coming weeks, the families have other battles for justice as they see it. Reviews into what police and health chiefs could have done to keep Calicane off the streets and free to kill their loved ones. Martin Brunt, Sky News. In January last year, Eleanor Williams was found guilty of perverting the court's course of justice after fabricating stories and creating fake evidence to frame innocent men for rape. She reported her story to the police and posted allegations on Facebook, claiming she was a victim of an Asian grooming gang in Cumbria. That prompted protests and even hate crimes in her community. So why did she construct such extraordinary lies? Sky News has launched a new podcast called Unreliable Witness to investigate this case. A warning that this clip coming up contains images of Eleanor Williams' injuries. She's just turned 22, but looks younger. The court's jury are following her every word. Eleanor Williams is giving her testimony. She's telling the court that she's been sexually abused and beaten countless times by a grooming gang. She's written more than a 1,000 words documenting her experience on Facebook. And those words have gone viral, drawing outrage and sympathy from all corners of the globe. Except Eleanor Williams isn't what she seems. She isn't the victim in this case. She is the one on trial. Her words on the stand, the prosecution say they're all lies. Her injuries, self-inflicted. Her story, a fabrication that caused friction in her community. It led to accusations, attacks and over a hundred other crimes. I'm Jason Farrell, Home Editor for Sky News. Together with specialist producer Liz Lane, we're examining a controversial story that gripped parts of Britain and asking, why did she lie? And is there any truth hidden among the falsehoods? If you scratch the surface, you start to discover these undercurrents. People who think they do already know this story will find out a lot of information that they will never have heard before. From Sky News Podcasts, this is Unreliable Witness. Well, with me in the studio now, Sammy Woodhouse. She is a campaigner and survivor of the Rotherham abuse scandal. Sammy, thank you so much for coming in to talk to us about this. Um, Jason Farrell's podcast series on this case is a fascinating exploration of what is an intriguing and disturbing case. A lot of people watching will remember this story making the headlines. Can you take me back to when this first came into the public domain and your initial reaction to it? And what happened after that? Well, it was a shocking case, weren't it? Everybody was talking about it. Um, and not just in her a, in a hometown. You know, this was being spoken about all over the country. Mm. And when I saw the Facebook post, you know, you've got um, pictures, you've got messages, which, you know, really horrific injuries. Mm. Um, and of course, you generally just think, oh my God, you know, this poor girl's been through so much. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I retweeted. Um, there wasn't, you know, for a second, 
did I think, is she lying? Mm. Um, just because, you know, it just seemed so genuine. But of course, as time went on, um, and I remember somebody contacting me and, and saying, you know, just be careful, there's a lot of question marks around this case. Um, and as time went on, uh, we realised just how shocking it actually were. Mm. Because she was lying. Yeah. And um, she was sentenced to eight and a half years in prison for perverting the course of justice. And Jason's podcast explores all the reasons as to, to why she may have done that and the legacy as to what happened, because there was a big period of time in between her going public on Facebook and it was, you know, it went viral, not yeah. just in this country, but around the world. It yeah. was viewed by hundreds of thousands of people. And there was a big vacuum between that coming out and then her going on trial as the accused rather than the accuser. And in that time, we saw a lot of things happen in Barrow in the community because, of course, you know, as you well know from the Rotherham abuse scandal, tensions were high, weren't they? People were on high alert for this yeah. kind of crime. Yeah, of course, and you know, you've got survivors and activists like me that have spent so much time, you know, saying to uh, people around the country, you know, that we tell the truth and that you should get behind us and support us. And come forward if you are a victim. Yeah, definitely. And it's so hard for us to come forward. And then, uh, of course, you know, we get all the backlash when we do. Mm. Um, so when she came forward, of course, people were outraged, there were protests. You know, um, there were even small businesses that were affected by this. So, you know, it weren't just, you know, people like these men, their families, mm. um, that were going through things. You know, a lot of people in their community yeah. uh, were as well. It really split the community and that legacy still being felt to this day to a certain degree. And a lot of degree. people, of course, because of what happened in towns like Rotherham and yeah. the police turned a blind eye and they were directly mm -hmm. involved, people thought that was the case, you know, with Ellie's case. Um, so, you know, she had an entire nation backing her. Yeah. Um, can you tell me what you believe that this case, Ellie's case, did for victims, survivors like yourself in these kind of horrific grooming scandals? Because, as you said, it's so difficult for you to come forward. It's so difficult for you to provide evidence, to yeah. talk about your experiences. Do you think that what happened with Ellie set what you're fighting for back to a certain degree? It did for many, yeah. Um, there were a lot of victims and survivors and some spoke out publicly, hid their identities and said, you know, we're now terrified to come forward. Um, and I think, you know, what we have to remember is there is a clear difference from coming forward and, and not having evidence to support mm. what you're saying and then coming forward and just telling blatant lies. But, you know, sometimes when we come forward, we don't have that evidence. Mm. You know, I was fortunate to have strong evidence in a strong case. Mm. Um, so people were just terrified and, and thought, well, will I get sent to prison, mm. you know, if, if I can't provide anything? Give us an insight as to what it took you to come forward. Like you said, you were on a good footing, if you like, in terms of, like you said, you had evidence, yeah. you know, DNA evidence and the like. A lot of young girls won't have that. Just yeah. give me an idea of what it was like for you who had the confidence of having something tangible to provide police with. Well, as I said, I had lots of evidence, including DNA evidence from my son. Mm. And before I went to the Times newspaper and exposed what happened mm. in Rotherham, I came to the police. Even when I was 16 years old, I went to the police. Mm. And unfortunately, they, uh, they didn't want to do anything. Um, so that is why I went to Andrew Norfolk and... The only reason why anything happened in Rotherham is because the Times published it. Mm. Um, and of course, what happened in Rotherham, you know, turned into a worldwide story. Mm. So that's the only reason why I got into that courtroom because many people mm. don't. But even now, you know, my perpetrator's in prison for 35 years. I still get called a liar. Um, I'm racist, I'm Islamophobic, I'm far right. You know, I get absolutely everything thrown at me. It's, it is honestly so difficult, so it baffles me why people do lie about mm. something like this, because we don't like to admit it, but, you know, some people do It does lie. happen. Ellie's not... Ellie's an extreme case. Yeah. But you've experienced it yourself, where people have come to you and not been genuine about what they're saying. Yeah, I remember a case, and when the Ellie case went public, I thought it was the same case, actually, but it wasn't. Um, a young girl uh, contacted me on social media and um, said she'd been exploited, sent me pictures, um, you know, sent me a lot of evidence. Yeah. I contacted the police to report it, but we didn't know, you know, who she was. Mm. Um, the National Crime Agency got involved. There was every police force in our country looking for her and they found her in a bedroom and it were all a hoax. Um, 
so yeah, unfortunately, it happens. In fact, on my social media today, I shared a story that a man had been found guilty because he's lied and mm -hmm. said six men raped him, and they didn't. Yeah. So it happens. It happens. And just a final question. Obviously, Rotherham has become synonymous with you know grooming gangs and that problem, but this isn't just isolated to one town or city. This happens up and down the UK. Do you think we're any closer to sort of uncovering the real scale of what's happening and getting a handle on this? this problem? Uh, no, I, I think our country is an absolute mess and I think that's down to politicians. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, everything has just turned political. Mm. Um, I don't think it'll ever get, um, you know, the, I suppose, treatment that it needs to be dealt with mm. because people in government don't want it, you know, to come to the surface. They've covered this up for many, many years, decades. Mm. Um, if they wanted something to be done and to protect children, it, it would have been done by now. I've been doing this for 11 years. Mm. I feel like I'm hitting my head against a brick wall, and truth is, we have an unfit system, but that system is working exactly like they want it to. Well, Sammy, look, we really appreciate you coming on the, uh, the programme, and I know we will speak again. Thank you so much um, for joining us here on The UK Tonight. Well, if you'd like to listen to uh, Sky News's podcast, Unreliable Witness, all episodes are available now wherever you get your podcast from. As still come on the UK tonight, opening up the conversation on cancer, how the Princess of Wales' announcement of her diagnosis has led to record traffic to UK charities' websites. And farmers descend on Westminster protesting against cheap food imports and what they call a threat to the UK's food security. And have Asian hornets become established in the UK? We'll speak to a bug expert about the country's earliest ever sighting. It took a huge amount of courage, I think, and she was very calm, very composed, so I think she did a fantastic job of it. Um, it must have been very emotional for her. Um, you can see she's, you know, she's been made up, she's had her hair done, so there must have been quite a long build-up to it, which I can only imagine how nervous and anxious she must have felt during that time when she was just preparing and getting ready. And then obviously completely heartbreaking when she says uh, the struggle to tell the kids that she's going to be OK. Yeah. Absolutely chestering. Why do you think William wasn't sat with her? I personally think that was the right call. I mean, some people have had a go at him on social media about this. <laughs> yeah, surprise, surprise. Yeah. Um, but after all the speculation and people saying, you know, the, uh, the photoshopped Mother's Day picture, I think it needed to be really simple, just her by herself telling her story um, with nobody else in the frame. I think it was actually a mistake to have the kids in the Mother's Day picture. Um, so I think it was the right call, and I think she just looks very candid and open and comfortable and honest. I think we can say that she still does have it because they're talking about her needing months out for treatment. Um, I think that we are not going to see her back on royal duties anytime soon. Um, and that I think the palace have a limited window now where they can think ahead to how public mood and attitude might change in a couple of months' time if we haven't had any kind of updates. So I think they might just want to get their heads around what their strategy will be. Obviously, most people will simply be concerned that she's OK and will want her recovery to be going well um, and will just be worried about her. But obviously, there is this contingent on, of people on social media spreading conspiracy theories. So we know that a vacuum is coming because they don't want to give a running commentary. So there will be a period of time in which people will be comfortable with that vacuum. But after a while, questions will start getting asked again. Yeah. And, you know, there's already people marauding around social media claiming the videos an AI-generated fake and all that kind of <laughs> which stuff. Which is absurd, completely absurd. <laughs> Farmers driving more than 100 tractors descended on Westminster today to protest against cheap food imports and what they're calling a threat to the UK's food security. They say they're operating at a disadvantage to European farmers who can undercut British farmers thanks to EU subsidies. And they made their presence felt during tonight's rush hour. 
Our correspondent Amelia Harper was there. This is absolutely unprecedented to see this in central London. You can hear the noise of these tractors as farmers from all across the UK have descended on Westminster. You can hear them honking there in the background, trying to get the government to notice. This has been put on by campaign group Save British Farming, and they say the government simply isn't prioritising British farmers. In terms of what is going on, uh, you can have a look here. We've got huge tractors waiting in a very long convoy. We've got some signs to the right, no farmers, no food. And if we come back to the left here, there's a sign which says a ban on dishonest labelling on the front of this tractor. And this is one of the aspects that farmers are trying to highlight. They say that there are uh, issues with dishonest labelling on food packaging. For example, if food is coming from abroad, it is then uh, labelled alongside a British flag. One of the main issues that they are saying is to do with Brexit, though, and to do with substandard uh, imports. You can hear them. There's actually tunes to some of the, the tractors as well. But as I was saying, Brexit is one of the main issues for farmers here. Substandard imports as a result of trade deals are making their way into the UK. Uh, products grown uh, that, uh, with chemicals, for example, that might not even pass British uh, welfare and British farming standards. Another issue is, uh, is labour for farmers. But here, there has been an absolutely huge turnout. If I walk a little bit across here, you can get an idea of just how many there are. Over 100 tractors have turned out today. They want to bring the countryside to London, and they certainly have done that, and they have got everyone's attention while they do it. Uh, well, they sure created a lot of fuss in Westminster today. Uh, maximum noise and fuss. Will it create maximum impact? Let's speak to farmer Richard Ash from the Save British Farming Group, which organised today's protest. And thank you so much for joining us, uh, Richard. It's my pleasure. Uh, what is it you want to tell the government? What do farmers want? Well, uh, there's a number of things, really. We'd like them to actually listen um, and come out and see us and talk to us. Because it seems to us that uh, governments sit in their uh, nice air-conditioned offices uh, with their nice heating on while we're outside um, uh, trying to harvest vegetables in the wet and the cold and the rain and do our job. Uh, and actually, nobody cares. Um, and we're not getting a fair uh, return for what we're doing. Uh, and we seem, it seems to, to us that government, uh, retailers, supermarkets and DEFRA are quite happy to fly in food from all over the world uh, and lorries going all over our roads um, when there is food that we can produce. With the huge carbon footprint that that leaves, uh, we're saying, oh, aren't we good um, in, in our carbon footprint? And we are just letting everybody else bring their uh, food over to compete unfairly with British growers. All we want to do is get a fair price, a reasonable price for what we do and to pr produce safe, good food for the British public. Well, Richard, you've been a farmer, potatoes and cereal and sandwich for 50 years, I understand. How bad has it got? How has it changed in that time? We you put a bit on my age, but anyway, let's not worry about oh, that, so shall we? I've probably got that information wrong. It was a last minute sort of change of guess. So go on, correct me. How long have you been farming a sandwich for? No, let's uh, let let's let's not worry about that, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, life life has become much more difficult for the for the British uh, grower and farmer. For young people, uh, there's less incentive for young people to come into farming. Mm. Uh, because uh, farmers are not really valued, we feel, uh, by either politicians or DEFRA or certainly by the supermarkets. And we would, all we're asking is to get a fair return and to be able to stop these imports with, that are less safe, that often they're using chemicals that were banned in the UK many, many years ago in the rest of the world um, and those chemicals are still being used and that food is still being put on the supermarket shelves mm. in front of the British public when we feel that our own food 
is far more secure. We could, do, what do we want? Tell us what, what, what we want. Do we want to become a country where we import all our food and we're then reliant on the rest of the world to feed us? Or would we like a group of people that actually know what they're doing and do it safely to produce our food for our British people? Um, what do you want UK consumers to do? Because you say the government's not talking to you. You know, we're in a cost of living crisis at the moment. People are, are watching what they buy, watching every penny. You know, when they go into supermarkets, the supermarket shop is different now. How can consumers help you if they want to support British produce? I understand exactly what you're saying, but we're all going through the same crisis. Mm. We as farmers are going through that same energy crisis, the same as you are with your energy bills. We have the same things, we're no different. We have our fuel prices gone up exactly the same. We have our wages gone up exactly the same. Yeah. We, have, we have a shortage of staff because people don't want to do the work anymore because it's, it's not attractive. So we're constantly, we're, we're, we're trying to hold back the tide um, so we would like people, obviously, to prioritise British food and support British farmers. And we're just asking for a level playing field mm -hmm. to stop unfair imports that are subsidised, you know, by, by, as you've quite rightly said, by other countries. And why are we putting them on planes? Why are we putting food on planes and then bringing it over? And, and all that damage that we're doing to the atmosphere and the environment uh, and putting on supermarket shelves for supermarkets to make lovely big fat profits for their uh, shareholders. Well, Richard, thank you so much for coming on to, to state your case so eloquently. Uh, and I'm sorry about adding a few years to your age. You've had a, di <laughs> you've had a very difficult day. You look good for it. So oh. I didn't mean to insult you in that way. Uh, Richard Ash from Save you British Farming. You certainly didn't insult me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure we will speak again. Uh, thank you so much for having me on to I talk look with forward I really to appreciate it. it. Thank you thank so you. much. Uh, still to come here on The UK Tonight, I'm going to speak to the chief executive of cancer care charity Maggie's about how the Princess of Wales's announcement about her cancer diagnosis opened up a conversation about the disease.
Hello, welcome back to the UK Tonight. Uh, now, Sarah Ferguson today praised the Princess of Wales following her announcement of her cancer diagnosis on Friday, saying it will do a tremendous amount of good. This comes after Macmillan Cancer Support said that its website has seen a surge in traffic since the Princess of Wales' video was released. And along with the King's admission about his diagnosis, it's hoped that the royal family have opened up a new conversation about cancer. And we're joining me now in the studio, Chief Executive of Cancer Care Charity, Maggie's Dame Laura Lee, um, who has generously said that I can just call her Laura for this interview. Um, so thank you so much, Laura, for joining us on the UK tonight. Um, as I said there, Macmillan and Cancer Research UK saying they've seen an uplift in traffic since Friday. What have you seen at Maggie's? Well, we've seen the same and we've also seen people coming into our centres wanting to talk about the impact of what they heard from Kate and mm. her own words on Friday and how much that resonated for them and how much that has meant to them. The video is only a couple of minutes long, but in it, mm. there was so much. I mean, if you unpick it, we can start with the fact that I was reflecting on Friday night in Windsor that when the King's diagnosis was announced, there was shock, there was upset, but also an acceptance that he's a man over 70. With the Princess of Wales, she is a young mum, 42, mm. three young children. And speaking to oncologists on Friday, they said, actually, there is a rise in the number of people in their 40s being diagnosed with cancer. And the knock-on effect of that, because of, because yeah. of the young lives and the implications involved in a young family, is something that needs to be talked about more. Absolutely. I mean, the ramifications of... Um, a young person getting a cancer diagnosis are, are huge. They're in the middle of their working life, so they're, they're highly productive. They've often, as um, uh, uh, Princess of, Prince of Wales have, children, mm -hmm. um, and how to take care of those caring responsibilities, how to keep the responsibilities for the house and the roof and the mm -hmm. mortgage, um, but then also the surrounding family. And I think what's not unique to them is, um, is Prince William has got both his father going through cancer but also his wife. And quite often, because one in two of us get a cancer diagnosis, quite often families are facing more than one person mm. going through cancer at the same time. And a lot of family members, depending on the circumstances and what happens, become carers, um, become the support network for mm. their spouse or their father going through it. And it's important, I know at Maggie's, for them to have support as well because you know it's a tough time a lot of the a lot of the burden falls on their shoulders i think it was one of the kind of I mean, was, as you said there was lots of messages that came out on but she talked about the need for time mm. um and all families need time to adjust to the diagnosis to adjust to the treatment options and choices, adjust to the impacts. It all moves so quickly, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. We're so after in the a, in a, it's a roller coaster. Yeah. And then it's that kind of ripple effect of then what the impact of, of mm. that. And it, and the, some people can get there quite quickly. Mm. Um, other people, it takes longer to process the enormity mm. of of what that diagnosis means for their immediate life, um, but also maybe for their more longer term. It's also opened up a conversation about how to talk to children mm. about cancer. You know, when you talk to children about their grandparents having cancer, it comes with age and, you know, the, you caveat it in that kind of way. When it's their mum who's so young and to them so fit and healthy and is their everything, it's different. And particularly when you have, like the, the Prince and Princess of Wales, they have three children of different ages, yeah. 10, 8 and 5. So you obviously navigate their... The, the different conversations differently. Absolutely. So they will have different responses and different uh, levels of understanding. Mm -hmm. um, they may have heard the word cancer um, regarding their grandfather mm -hmm. um, before then hearing about um, uh, their mum. Um, and I think what we often say at Maggie's is there's no one right response mm -hmm. to telling your children, A, you've got to give yourself time to adjust to the information yourself. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people want to practice the words that they want to tell. Um, but you know your children best mm -hmm. and you know how best to communicate with them. And it's often about giving it in small chunks, sometimes not being surprised when the children say, oh, that's fine, what's for dinner? <laughs> um, and they just want to kind of, as long as you're keeping life kind of routine yeah. and normal, they can actually cope with and handle quite a lot. What they can, though, is pick up as secrets if they think that something's mm. been hidden from them, and that can make them anxious and worried. So the more you can do to help your children feel confident and 
um, and that you're, you're, you're with them in what you know at, at that point will keep them with you. Yeah, uh, a lovely final um, part of the video where the Princess of Wales was keen to point out that, you know, if you are the one in two, yeah. you're not alone. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we hear all the time is people feel a sense of aloneness, mm -hmm. a feelings of loss of control and that hopelessness. And she said two key things was, is there is hope uh, and you're not alone. And that was a beautiful message to, to share with um, um, those people going through cancer. And they heard it loud and clear. Yeah, very much so. It's important to, to open the conversation and to keep it going. And uh, Dame Laura Lee, CEO of Maggie's, uh, thank you so much for your time here in the UK tonight. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you. Uh, next on the UK tonight, um, Asian hornets. Apparently, they are becoming more established here in the UK. We're going to talk to a bug expert about just how serious the situation could get. And in sport, Nottingham Forest are fighting against their four-point deduction in the Premier League. What does it mean for a relegation battle? Putin admits Islamist terrorists carried out the gun attack which left 137 people dead. But he continues to insist Ukraine ordered the massacre. We'll hear from mourners in Moscow and ask what their leader will do next. And we'll be live in the Haitian capital too, where three million children now need humanitarian assistance. Join me at nine o'clock. news from the sky news center at seven now that you're up to date we can go into a bit more detail things can change incredibly quickly taken by surprise have you ever known a moment like this in british politics before yes <laughs> cheers we'll start with breaking news let's get the latest on the ground so by the end we'll hopefully all understand what's going on in the world just that little better Big stories don't always come from big cities. I'm Lisa Dowd and I'm Sky's Midlands correspondent and this is where I grew up. We can reveal that the driver who hit Harry Dunn is 42-year-old Anne Sekoulas. Just met the president and we never thought we'd get this far. This is what they're up against, that the wind is the really big problem. It is back-breaking work and the smoke is thick. It's been working well. Water levels are dropping, but no one knows what impact further rain will have. What would you do if this place wasn't open? So. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. It's really scary. We're terrified. In this community, I'm told that everybody knows someone affected by COVID. Hopefully this will be the last wave. I never knew they would make it. It's amazing. Change seems tantalisingly close in this corner of the UK. Wales was the first to introduce the plastic bag charge. This is my patch, my specialism. It's also my home. Uh, coming up, fears the predatory Asian hornet may have become established in the UK. We'll have all the details for, for you. But first, um, Darmish is here with the sport. Um, we are going to talk about Nottingham Forest mm. and this point deduction that they're appealing against. Yeah, so, yeah, so remember last Monday they were deducted those mm. four points for breaching profitability and sustainability rules. We're told it's highly unlikely that that point deduction will go up as a result of that appeal. Mm -hmm. Time scale wise, this is what everybody is talking about. This appeal should be heard within the next three weeks. If they win that appeal and some of the points come off, those points will come off immediately. Mm -hmm. As we know, that four point deduction meant that Forrest went from outside the relegation zone to into the relegation zone and one point off safety. Um, so 
I'm thinking of the word chaos, but not yet, not yet, yeah, not yeah. until this appeal has been heard. But it just looks like more uncertainty for the clubs in and around the relegation. So what are the sort of implications at the moment? Look, in fairness to Forest, their hierarchy wanted all of this done really quickly, not only for themselves, for clarity for themselves, but clarity for the rest of yeah. the league. But now you've got a situation where Everton, you'll remember, were docked 10 points. Mm -hmm. That was reduced to six, but they've been found in breach for a second time at the same time that Forest were. Their hearing into that started today. Now, if they get points deductions, there's likely there'll be an appeal for that, potentially. It's going to extend the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I think the last thing the Premier League want is the season finishing and then appeals being heard after the season finishes. Oh, can, no, can they've got imagine, to get it done before that, Can you imagine they? if, for example, Luton Town, who are the closest to, the, mm. to Everton and Forest at the minute, if they are safe come the last day mm. of the season when the full-time whistle blows, they'll be celebrating, but it might just be with a note of caution. Mm -hmm. Hold on, there might be an appeal after that mm. might still relegate us. So I don't think that they want to do that. And all of this is for another day, unlike the rest of tonight's sport. <laughs> this Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people, more active. Live life with Vitality. One in five people are neurodivergent, meaning they have a difference in brain function. This one in five may be autistic, dyslexic, dyspraxic, or have ADHD, or another form of neurodiversity. I think being in sport as someone who's dyslexic and dyscalculic um, can be really challenging day to day, particularly with the numbers and distances and times and things. I think it's something that I've come to realise that the reasons why I do sport have very much to do with the fact that I am neurodiverse as well. Obviously, people will have heard probably of, of dyslexia. I mean, give me a sense of um, what it's like to, to, be, to be both dyslexic and dyscalculic. Dyslexia is words um, and literacy. I'll read a passage of text and I could read it three or four times, but it might not fully go in. It's processing in my brain takes a little bit longer. Um, but for me, with dyscalculia, I feel like that affects me a lot more as an adult. Give me a sense of, of how that all comes comes to play. What, what are the main challenges, would you say, in sport? I've been known to miss a couple of flights. Um, and yeah, I think when you see those things on the board where I've sort of read the flight time. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Now, conservationists are warning Asian hornets may have become established in the UK. This is after the earliest ever sighting of the predatory insect, insect this year. Now, the government has confirmed that the insect was spotted this month, uh, the 11th to be exact, indicating a possible stay over winter. Now, Asian hornets pose a huge danger to the UK's pollinators, with the insects able to eat 30 to 50 honeybees a day. Terrifying. Uh, Paul Hetherington from conservation group Bug Life joins me now to tell us more. These sound like a real problem. What are your thoughts on hearing that uh, the first Asian hornet was spotted on the 11th of March? It's extremely worrying. I mean, we know that they've already established themselves now in northern France, which means they can actually fly across the channel quite easily. So keeping them out of the country is going to be very, very difficult. But it is also a fact that in the latter part of last year, August, September and October, over 14 nests were destroyed and not all of them were in Kent. Now, at that stage, new queens will have already hatched, gone off to find somewhere to overwinter. So it is virtually certain now that the Asian hornets are breeding and living in the UK. And that's huge concern. As you said, an adult Asian hornet can eat roughly 50 honeybees. That also transcribes to an entire nest of bumblebees for one hornet. So imagine what a nest of them could be doing to our population of bees. That is incredible. I mean, I'm looking at the size of them as well on our footage there. What's the knock-on effect then? We know that bees are in danger in this country, but what could the effect of the Asian hornets be on bees and the ripple effect after that? They could have quite a catastrophic impact on bees because, again, because they've come in from abroad, there are not a lot of things that are going to predate them in this country. Uh, so it's very, very worrying. And, of course, 
they're establishing in the moment in southern England, and that is where some of our rarest bumblebees exist, things like the shrill cardaby and the brown-banded cardaby. So it'd be quite easy to see them having a devastating impact on populations like that. And, of course, the knock-on effect will also be a devastating impact on pollination in this country. Uh, if we lost all our pollinators, it would put about £2 billion a year on our food bill for selected foods like fruit and peas, etc., because we have to pay people the minimum wage to go out and hand pollinate. Oh. So the knock-on effect for consumers in this country alone would be absolutely catastrophic if they get established and wreak havoc. Paul, this is not good news. What do people do if they spot them? You must report them immediately, even if you're not 100% sure, because it could be a European hornet, uh, which are actually quite welcome visitors to our, our gardens and our landscape. But if you see something, report it. The people will come out there, they will check it out. If it's a European hornet, nothing to worry about. If it's an Asian hornet, they will try and track it down. And sometimes they will actually put a little tracking device on board one if they can capture it, and then they can track it back to its nest. And that's the only way really to find where these nests are and to be able to destroy the nest. So if you see something, even if you're in doubt, report it. If you can get a picture, even better. Paul, excellent message to end on. Uh, thank you very much, Paul Hetherington there uh, from Bug Life. Really good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, uh, let's have a quick look at the weather before we go. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. Unsettled for the next few days, temperatures around the seasonal average, but it's looking milder for Easter. It's going to be quite wet this evening with outbreaks of rain for many. Snow on Scottish hills, the Midlands, the southeast and north of Wales look mostly dry, though. The Northern Isles can expect showers. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways.